Good morning and welcome back to the Chaps Guide, the channel where we usually talk about men's style, self-development and personal grooming. But today I'm going to have a Q&A session and I'm going to just take this opportunity to answer some of the many questions that you viewers uh, post to me in the comment section below. Now ordinarily I do try to answer most of the questions I get actually in the comment section. I respond to you as quick as I can but occasionally you know there's some really good questions which I think merit sharing or you know in the comment section you you get very limited interaction so I'd like to expand on some of that uh, some of those answers I'd like to give. So today and uh, you know perhaps in the future we'll do the odd Q&A Excuse me for having a brew. It's a glorious autumn day here in the UK. The sun is bursting through the clouds and it's just great. So great to get outdoors and, and just have this chance to have a chat. So let's get going. Let's get started. And my first question comes from somebody called William Logan. And I'll read what he says. Um, this might be a, a stupid question. Let me stop you there, William. There are no stupid questions, all right? We all got questions to ask. Uh, but where do you stand, no pun intended, on the use of SEGS, which are, for the uninitiated, the term which we tend to use in the UK to refer to the, the plates which you apply to the heel and the toe of your shoe to stop the shoe wearing down? Um, steel or rubber, especially for people who are walking on their heels heavily and wearing them down quickly. Uh, it was an issue I had as a child on my school shoes, but not so much as an adult. It's a good question. Uh, and I think I'll perhaps use an example, you know, really. I uh, used to have steel plates placed in the, in the heel of a particular brand of shoes. I, I still do wear them. That's Sanders Black Cap to Oxfords. And they have a, a stacked leather heel which means that that leather wears down quite quickly. And from time to time, I used to have a quarter steel um, plate applied to the heel in the local cobblers. And the thing that really ground me down with those was the constant clip-clop, clip-clop that my shoes used to make as the heel hit the concrete or the wood or whatever. And it announces your presence way before you arrive. And as a good gentleman, you know, you want to be kind of inobtrusive. So it really annoyed me and I had those plates removed. And I went over to having rubber plates in the heel. So to answer your question, I'm fully behind the use of some sort of plate if you do wear down your heels or the toe you can have a, a plate placed on the toe not so bad if you use steel on the toe because obviously it doesn't strike the ground as the same as your heel but yeah it's worth going to your local cobbler i wouldn't do it myself i know you can buy these kits where you can apply the the plates at home and you can adhere them yourself using a glue or nail them in it's never going to have the same effect as your local cobbler who does it day in, day out, and they're an expert. So spend a few pounds, have those plates applied, stay away from the steel. Uh, I would go for the rubber and that way you'll get much longer wear out of those heels. Hope that answers your question, uh, William. So another question on shoes from Ronnie Hat. Now Ronnie asks, I can see from your channel that you produce a number of shoe related videos. It's one of our most popular ones. Uh, can you offer some advice? I have very wide feet, wider than the widest hitch fitting available off the peg. Um, I've emailed all the Northampton shoemakers uh, to see if any other options. I can't afford to go down the bespoke footwear route and I was wondering how to make the best of what's available. Well, I've done a bit of research into this, uh, Ronnie, to help you with this outcome. Now, the first thing I would advise if you're close to meeting that hitch fitting, obviously you can stretch the shoe to a degree. So it's worth going to the cobbler because they've got some tools they can place into the shoe and it'll incrementally, by screwing it up, increase the size of your shoe. You can buy them yourself as well if it's going to be a long-term thing, which I suggest it probably will be if you've got larger feet. Uh, look for them on eBay, places like that. I've got one myself. You just place it into the shoe and it's like a, it's like a shoe tree that you can incrementally increase in size using a screw mechanism. But I would go to the cobblers in the first place because they've got better kit. They'll be able to do it for you. They'll be able to stretch that shoe a little bit. Whoop, bit of wind. Turn that around. Um, alternatively, uh, the other thing you can do is try and source wider shoes from the many manufacturers which are, you know, uh, catering to people with bigger feet. Um, 
I went online, I had a really good poke around, and I noticed there's a couple of websites called widefitshoes.co.uk um, if you're British, uh, High and Mighty, of course, which is an international brand, uh, and other ones like Shoes International. Now, they curate collections of shoes specifically for people who are shall we say, outside the, outside the norms when it comes to the size ratios which are normally offered by manufacturers on width and length as well, because, you know, big and tall people. Um, so that's the second route. Obviously, it's going to be a bit more expensive than stretching an existing pair, but it might be a better fit longer term. And finally, I mean, you talk about bespoke, and yeah, this is very expensive. Um, if you look at somebody like uh, George Cleverley, who are quite well renowned for making bespoke shoes, John Lobbs, all of the big manufacturers, you'll be talking three, four, five thousand pounds for a pair of bespoke shoes. The cheapest bespoke shoes I, were, I was able to find was in the UK alone, was um, James Taylor and Sons up in London and they charge round about £1,500. And that'll, you know, that's the whole process from having your foot, a 3D scan of your foot, and a shoe made to your exact specifications. Now, £1,500 is a lot of money, but I guess if you're looking long-term and a price per wear ratio, you know, you will have an exceptional pair of shoes. If you buy a pair of shoes like a black cap to Oxford or a black brogue of some kind, which is going to be universally wearable, that pair of shoes is going to last you for decades, right? If you look after it properly, wear it only when necessary, um, and keep it well maintained. You can have them resold and so on. Uh, price per wear, it's probably going to work out cheaper than the other option of buying, you know, um, shoes from High and Mighty and these other manufacturers. So think about what's going to fit you best in the long term. So I hope that helps for you, Ronnie, and good luck on that. Feed back into us how you get on. We'll share it with everybody else. So I uh, had a question here from somebody called Alan D, and it was in relation to a recent video I did called uh, Cheap Shoes. And he puts, very informative video, have you got a top five brands you would recommend when it comes to shoes? The answer is yes. But again, it's highly dependent on the price point that you want to be at. Lovely, enjoying the tea. So, for me personally, I'm an ordinary working guy. I don't have a pile of money to throw at shoes. If you're in that category, this is kind of where I would be. Now, I'm a Brit, so in this country, my go-to day-to-day shoes are Loke. They're a good British manufacturer. They make several different tiers of shoe, but the highest tier is called 1880. They're the ones I would go for. They are still modestly priced, normally under 300 pounds. They're manufactured in the UK of very good quality products. That's where I would go for in the UK as my entry level. If I was abroad, America, North America, Allen Edmonds perform a very similar function to Loke, but in the States, they're a bit more expensive, but they they're similar level, so that's where kind of where we are with that. Um, but underneath Loke, or not under, but you know more more, more money, um, I'd be looking at Cheney. That's a British Northamptonshire manufacturer again. Um, more expensive, you know, in the three to four to five hundred pound category, but exceptional quality shoes, gonna last you for decades. Same sort of sphere, Grenson. Most of the shoes I have in my collection are Grenson. I've bought them on eBay pre-owned. In the most case, very modestly priced, excellent shoes. Been wearing them for years and years, never let me down so far, great quality. Um, but if I was gonna go out today and spend my own money on a brand new shoe, I would probably go to Carmina or Miamin. Now these are two Spanish manufacturers uh, on the island of Mallorca, and they make really good quality shoes for the three to 400, 500 pound category. You won't go far wrong with those. Hit them up on the internet, have a good look. They do the, the, you know, the normal range of uh, brogues and uh, Oxfords and things like that. Try them as a starting point. Thanks for your question. So let's have a look. What have I got here? Another shoe one. Let's try something else, shall we? Let's have a look. What have I got? A um, lot of shoe ones. Here's a fragrance one. This is from Simon FNP. Oh, it's a shoe one. I beg your pardon. And his question is, I love your channel, sir. Do you know if you can resole Clark's Desert Boots? And that's in response to a, a video I did a while ago on Clark's Desert Boots. Clark's Desert Boots, the originals, are around about, in this country, 100 British pounds. And I guess they're going to be representative of that price wherever you live in the world. Um, 
their crepe soled shoe. Personally, I wouldn't have them resold because at £100 for a brand new pair, you know, having them resold, I don't think it's going to be economically viable. It's probably going to be better off investing your money in a new pair of shoes. Let's be honest, they're mostly, uh, they're mostly suede. Uh, they're not, you're not talking about patinering a pair of shoes that are going to look better over and over time. They're only manufactured of two pieces of suede. They're not you know, intricate shoes. Um, I would basically just buy a new pair. I don't think it's worth having Clark's Desert Boots resold unless you've got some sort of deep-seated sentimental relationship with them. So that's what my thoughts are on that. Um, here we go. This is a question from Andy Rayo, who asks about, uh, I, did, I did a video on Floris a while ago, the gentleman's fragrance uh, perfumier from London. And he puts, I have a question about Floris 89. I see they sell an aftershave and an EDT, Eau de Toilette, uh, which is best? Well, they're two different products, to be honest. I've talked about in some of my fragrance reviews, the fragrance sort of chart, really, of concentration. Now, aftershave is the very lowest level of concentration of the active or potent elements of the fragrance. And it tends to be quite heavily weighted towards alcohol with the hint of the fragrance within it, probably two to 3% potency in reality. Your eau de toilette, on the other hand, is something which would normally come in an atomizer and would normally be uh, applied as a fragrance, not necessarily on your chin after you've shaved, can be used for that, but generally it's around providing that aura of fragrance that you're going to apply. Now, Eau de Toilette kind of sits in the middle of that fragrance potency chart. Uh, it's kind of what most men's fragrances come generically as, unless you're going something a bit stronger, which is an Eau de Parfum, or weaker, which is an Eau de Cologne. But Eau de Toilette, kind of your norm. Uh, and I know Floris, number 89, Eau de Toilette, that's what you want to buy if you want to apply it over the body uh, to be the fragrance provider for your for your appearance the aftershave really you should be buying if you intend to apply it after you've shaved i actually own very few aftershaves i do have a few some which i really favor like tabac but uh, when it comes to applying fragrance eau de toilette normally you get more bang for buck more longevity more silage aftershave really just for shaving so if you're going to buy florence 89 personally for me eau de toilette the edt is the route to go hope that helps handy let's have a look so uh, an observation from vic lucy here i like your channel very helpful um, it's helped me improve quite a bit by the way is that a kelly kettle that you use when you're brewing up your tea when you're outdoors uh, and making a brew and the answer is yes it is well spotted Kelly Kettle, been around for a very long time. It's a very uh, useful and practical tool for making boiling water in the outdoors. It's a very ingenious product. I'm not endorsed by them in any way, but I've been using this very Kelly Kettle for 15 years, maybe more actually, uh, in the outdoors. And they, it's probably my most used bushcraft tool. Made this cup of tea this morning from it. Tastes great. So Kelly Kettle, hit them up on the internet. I'll put a link in the comment section below. Very well worthwhile. Now here's an observation uh, which somebody has made and it, it's uh, under the name I'm Still Here. And the observation they've made is I don't believe you can be both Welsh and a chap. Now this alludes to the fact, if you haven't already noticed by my distinct colloquial accent, I am originally from Wales, although I live in England and have lived here for a long time. Uh, and the Welsh um, persona is perhaps not that closely linked with chaps. Well, I would beg to differ with you, sir. I think Welsh people can equally be chaps. Um, the Prince of Wales is perhaps one of the greatest chaps who are in the country at the moment or in the world for his standard of sartorial elegance, I would suggest. And he is, of course, the, the prince of our proud principality. Um, but also, you know, I would point you in the direction of some of the great dresses of the past, like Richard Burton, uh, Anthony Hopkins, so, to, to quote some of the more visible actors, perhaps. But no, I think, in all seriousness, you can be a chap from wherever you are from. If you're from a very poor background, as in reality I came from, or you're from a very privileged and wealthy background, being chap is a state of mind and you don't have to have a lot of money or a fancy education 
or a posh background to be a chap. It's about being a gentleman. A chap is a gentleman in all reality. And that, sir, is a gift that you can uh, receive wherever you are from. You just need to apply those principles in your life. But thank you for asking the question because it gave me the opportunity to, to um, give you my observations about being a chap. So what else have I got here? Um, this is a question uh, specific to a video I did a while ago about my Tudor GMT wristwatch. Um, I'm not wearing it today. Um, and the question is from are you Varkas? And the question is, interesting video, can I ask about your Tudor GMT, did it have the date issue? Now this is something I didn't mention in that video. Um, a lot of Tudor GMT wristwatches have suffered from an issue where the date wheel, the little window which indicates the date, has become stuck between two dates and it has necessitated many people sending them back for repair. Um, personally, I haven't suffered that issue on my Tudor. I've owned it since um, March of 2020. I don't wear it consistently. I wear it in rotation with a number of other pieces I have. But when I have worn it, it's never had an issue. I believe that was an issue with the earlier watches. And as a result, they've been improved by Tudor. But uh, no problem so far. If it does happen, I'll update you. So what have we got here? Um, I've got a question from Paul Jones. Good video, Ash. Um, I have a collection of men's style books, a few suggestions for you to consider. Now this relates to a book I did a while ago about uh, a book by um, uh, Alan Flusser. Really fantastic Bible for men when it comes to style. And Paul Jones here suggested a few others, which I'm not really making an observation on. I haven't read them, but it's worth sharing with you if you wish to improve your learning on the art of being a chap. And this is um, The Perfect Gentleman by James Sherwood. Uh, Gentleman by Bernhard Rotzel, I've heard of that one, I understand that's very good. Um, Sharp Suits by Eric Musgrave and True Style by G. Bruce Boyer. Now he says these are all available on Amazon and other booksellers, new or used. Um, I'm going to look some of those up and I'll come back to you guys and let you know what I think. I'm going to start with The Perfect Gentleman by James Sherwood because it sounds like something I'd like to read. So I'm going to buy that, come back to you, give you a review. Thanks for letting me know, Paul. And if any of you others have some ideas along the same lines, drop them in. I'd be happy to, uh, to do some research on that for you. So what have I got here? Let's have a look. This is by somebody called TNMT Temerity. Um, and it's about cravats. I regularly wear cravats as I don't like something tight around my neck. People are curious about them, ask me where to get them. They seem pretty uncommon in America. Well, thanks for coming to me with your advice. Cravats are still a bit of a niche wear wherever you live. I think they're a definite delineation between the ordinary chap and the really chap chap. Uh, I like cravats. As you say, they're less formal than a tie. They're less restrictive than a tie. You obviously wear an opened collared shirt with a tie, which allows you to control the, the sort of tightness around your throat if that's an issue for you. So where do you get them? Well, I've sourced most of mine from eBay uh, and from AliExpress. I recently bought a bit of a job lot, actually, of uh, six used cravats, quite old-fashioned ones from the 60s. I have to say they were great styles, lots of, uh, lots of lovely paisleys and other colours. Throw them in the washing machine and, you know, they're yours. You know, it's not like, although they're pre-owned, let's be honest, it's a bit of material. It's nothing fancy, you know, it's nothing which is going to upset me about buying something else, uh, somebody else's product. Uh, but if you want brand new, go to eBay. Go to AliExpress. Yes, they are going to mostly be polyester. They will be sourced from probably uh, Asia somewhere, Southeast Asia or China. But you get a, a perfectly acceptable cravat which you can employ, looks great, cuts a dash, sets you out from the hood. Um, I recently started using Etsy, which is another platform allowing you to access smaller manufacturers. Bought a few pocket squares, things from there. Have a look at that if it's available to you wherever you live in the world. But yeah, eBay, AliExpress, that's the place to go. And of course, modestly priced as well. So finally, let's have a look. What shall I? Lord Ford, as somebody has posed this, 
Dear Ash, congrats on getting 500 subscribers. Thanks for that, we're pushing a thousand now, we're moving along fast. I'm sure there'll be many more in the future. I came to this channel through a friend who had seen you speaking at a function. Oh good, a local uh, uh, sort of collaborator. Uh, not sure where, but she knew I was going for a big job interview and sent me a link to your presentation tips. I took on board everything you said, personalized my PowerPoint presentation, and it was a winner. I got the job. I've since been told that I completely nailed the interview. I am so very grateful for you for those simple but valuable tips. Since then, I've watched all of your videos on shoes and fragrance, and I personally feel uh, one can only have so much of shoes and fragrance. Um, I find your presentation so compelling to watch. Um, more personal development tips gets the vote from me. Well, thanks for feeding that back, Lord Ford. I am so grateful for you telling me that you were able to gain some benefit from those. Some of my earliest videos were actually around presentations and public speaking. And I just want to share something with you because I live this life with you. I live the lifestyle that I ex extol with you here in these videos. A couple of weeks ago, I'm transitioning between careers. I'm retiring from one career path. I used to be, or well, I still am, in law enforcement, but my pension has matured, so I'm moving forward. And I had a job interview the other day. I applied all of the principles which I talked about in my videos, and I aced the, idiot of the interview too. And now I've got a new job to go to as well, as a result of employing all of those tips and advice which I suggested to you. So we're living this life together. I'm glad it was helpful for you. It's been helpful for me too recently, so great result for us both. And there we go. So, I hope you found that useful. If you've got questions, advice, tips or advice that you want to share, I'll try and do one of these Q&A videos from time to time to give us the opportunity to share advice between ourselves and allows me to answer the questions you have for me. So send them in in the comments section below or via the email address in the About section on on this uh, on this channel so until the next time we meet i wish you well i hope you and your family stay safe and well and we'll meet each other very soon take care